Good morning and welcome to the show from the University of Otago, Professor Robert Patman. Robert, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Pat. How are you? I'm doing well. Yourself? How's life at the Very university? Good, moment? Are, we, are we back into normal operation yet or 80% normal operation at the no, university? No, no, not really. Um, I, I think there's a hope there may be some more in-person teaching on campus at the University of Otago after the mid-semester break. Right. After Easter, in other words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking the same for school kids. I've got two. Yeah. Uh, I've got one at secondary school, one intermediate school, and we're feeling that hopefully we'll go back to some kind of normal life after the school holidays, which is in about three weeks from now because the school holidays, I think, are the end of next week and then two weeks holidays. So that's what we're kind of fingers fingers crossed for. Um, and, yeah, and, and, and later on in this show, we're going to be talking to uh, Michael uh, Plant from Christchurch about the current model, well, what's going on at the moment, at the moment with the COVID modeling. So, because it feels like it's a bit longer than it should have been at the moment. It feels like this, we're still in that, in the sort of middle of this peak. But anyway, um, we let's not beat around the bush. We have you here to talk about international relations, international politics. We want to talk about the Solomon Islands and we want to talk about what's happening with China uh, in the Solomon Islands or, or maybe even without saying what's happening, is there something happening? with China and the Solomon Islands, there was a story that came through. I mean, there's, uh, there's stories all over the world at the moment, but there was one that came through on uh, One News the other night about what's happening, uh, a relationship between the two countries, between the Solomon Islands and between China. Um, and I'll just bring that story up. Here we go. And there's lots of things being said in this article. Uh, the Solomon Islands Prime Minister has come out swinging against criticism over a controversial security arrangement involving military. It's about the sign with China. Uh, the Prime Minister of the Solomons added uh, that the notion held by some leaders that, quote, the, that the region's security is threatened by the presence of China's region, end quote, is utter nonsense. He made clear that the Solomon Islands intends to continue its partnership with China, but added that, New Zealand and Australia would be considered partner of choice when it comes to the need to call for assistance in critical times. And in a statement, our Foreign Affairs Minister Nanao Mahuta said the Solomon Islands proposed agreement with China would not benefit New Zealand or its Pacific neighbours. And, and this is a quote, and quote, we will continue to raise our strong condemnation of such agreement directly with the countries involved. Uh, what I thought we could also do, uh, Robert, is just have 60 seconds of the actual PM uh, of the Solomons telling us uh, when he was speaking to Parliament what he said about about it all, kind of talking about um, the furore put up by other countries is a bit of nonsense. So let's just have a quick listen to that as well. We find it very insulting, Mr. Speaker, to be branded as unfit to manage our sovereign affairs or have other motives in pursuing our national interests. Australian media is on about Solomon Islands uh, is being pressured by the People's Republic of China to build a military base in Solomon Islands, which is only 2,000 meters, kilometers away from the northern shores of Australia. That's Australian media, Mr. Speaker. Where does that nonsense come from? The security treaty, Mr. Speaker, is pursued at the request of Solomon Islands government. We are not pressured. We are not pressured in any way by our new friends. And there is no intention whatsoever, Mr. Speaker, to ask China to build a military base in Solomon Islands. So there you go. there's the uh, Prime Minister speaking to his parliament uh, as to the whole situation and perhaps the complaints coming in from some of the Solomon Islands neighbours, such as New Zealand. Uh, Robert, what are your thoughts? Uh, it's an interesting development, and um, it, it seems to me um, that both Australia and New Zealand um, seem to have been taken aback by this development. They obviously have quite good intelligence, but it seems to me that uh, the Solomon's Prime Minister is making the case that since uh, Solomon's already has uh, a security agreement uh, with uh, Australia um, that doesn't preclude some sort of security agreement with China. And um, I suppose the concern from both Australia and New Zealand is that they both have been worried about China's activities in the Pacific, certainly going back to 2018 in New Zealand's case. Right. Um, 
and so I, I suppose this is the, the realization of their worst fears that the that China is looking to have a military presence in the region. Um, and yeah, it's interesting, however, the Solomon's prime minister, I think, sees things quite differently. I think he sees, he's not going to put it this way, but I, I think he looks at it as taking advantage of the geopolitical competition between democracy, which involves China and um, Russia, and liberal democracies, which involve countries like Australia and uh, New Zealand. So in a sense, uh, He's aware of that rivalry. Um, it enables him to maximise the possibilities and particularly financial support for the Solomons. Um, you talked about the um, military kind of uh, uh, arrangement between Australia and the Solomons. Um, I, I, I actually think you're 100% right. I mean, I know I'm a bit of a simpleton at the best of times, Robert, but if it was a business arrangement and you could go to your competitors your, your customers competitors and get a better arrangement people would go oh smart business it's not a business arrangement it's a it's geopolitical situation but i i have no doubt that the solomons are going if australia and new zealand won't give us what we want or need there are other people out there wink wink nudge nudge um but also you are just stating that there is a military arrangement between Australia and the Solomons. I mean, can a country have a military arrangement with multiple partners? And is there anything geopolitically? Well, that's, or, or that, that, that's that, what that, the Solomons that, Prime Minister is stating. Yeah, uh, right. He doesn't seem to see any, any contradiction. And I think from his point of view, his leverage to extract support for his country might be diminished by aligning himself with what, just one party. Um, aligning himself with two keeps them both on their toes from his point of view. Yeah. And um, we must be quite clear here. He he has categorically ruled out China having a military base in the Solomons. Uh, in addition, it's quite clear that this particular leader of the Solomons has been tilting towards China since he ended the Solomons relationship with Taiwan. I think it was 2019, 2018, around that period. And that was a clear signal that he saw more potential of support for the Solomons from China than he did Taiwan. And uh, so he ended the relationship with Taiwan uh, then. So there's been a steady tilt towards China. Um, it, it is, it, it, you know, I, I, in a sense, if you look at it from the Solomon's point of view, um, they are just maximizing what leverage they have to extract more support. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, and as I said, I, I know that sounds, I'm oversimplifying it talking about a business, but I can understand if you've got multiple interested parties in your product, in this case being the Solomon Islands, then you can leverage them off against each other. The, the yeah. other thing I was going to ask you, and not to compare it to an extreme example right now, but there is a part of the world where we are going, this is a sovereign nation. How dare this other sovereign nation, you know, tell this sovereign nation what to do? I'm, I'm talking about Russia and um and Ukraine, obviously, how dare how dare Russia try and tell Ukraine what to do? But on a very minor scale, it looks like on some level, New Zealand and Australia are trying to tell Solomon's what to do. Now, I'm not comparing them directly because one is a, a a war, but what I mean, sort of, what right do New Zealand and Australia even have to put up a bit of a stink over the Solomon Islands if they want to deal with someone else? Well, I I mean, put this in context, I would. I think both Australia and New Zealand have been sensitised by the events, um, the Russian invasion in particular of Ukraine, because I think it, it brought home, particularly to New Zealand, I think New Zealand, uh, and I think the other thing here is New Zealand has been a little bit taken aback by China's uh, leaning tilt towards Russia. It, China's been very measured in its support for Russia, but I, I think for a long time, in New Zealand eyes, we tended to make a distinction between the authoritarian regime of Russia and China. And I think what may be happening in New Zealand, and this way we may be converging a little bit of Australia now in perceptions, that, that we, we've had run-ins with China before uh, over the Huawei situation back in 2019. Yeah, yeah. Um, We made it quite clear then we wouldn't accept a a master-servant relationship with China for economic reasons. I don't think our positions changed in that sense. I think what's changed 
is that we're becoming increasingly concerned whether China is actually becoming much more forward leaning for since the free trade deal of 2008 between New Zealand and China, the first of its kind, by the way, in the world between a developed state, New Zealand and China. Um, we always took the business, we always took the pragmatic view it was possible to do business with China without actually having any implications for our values, our norms, our political system. And I think there's been an erosion of that perception because of China's behavior during Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the autocracy per se. The distinction between Russian authoritarianism and Chinese authoritarianism may have eroded a bit, I think, Pat in the last few weeks and that there may be a suspicion that authoritarianism um, by definition feels challenged by liberal democracy and that China may be trying to expand its um, political model to the Pacific. But, you know, against that, I'm, I'm also, you know, I personally, I'm a little bit skeptical because I think the Pacific Island countries actually in a sense, welcome the emergence of China because it just gives them much more bargaining leverage. Yeah. Well, I mean, also, I mean, as you're as you're stating and reminding me of our free trade dealment uh, arrangement, sorry, um, I'm I'm not. I, I guess what I want to make clear is I'm not putting out there, you know, New Zealand should shut up and take it. China's in the in the right here. I'm not stating that in any way, shape, form whatsoever. But it does cause me to go. We're happy to have a free trade agreement with China and take the money. You know, like that that's our, their, our biggest exporter. And now that there is another country on some level, I'm not being naive to say there's not nefarious situation there and potentially there's ulterior motives and stuff, but another country looks to benefit from China and we go, well, oh, no, hang on, no, no, no. And and whilst I hear what you're saying, and if I can repeat it back to you simply, one of the reasons New Zealand and Australia are showing concern is we're seeing China as a potential russia right now as opposed to just being a standard you know uh arrangement or agreement between any two liberal democracies and if and if another and if a if a russian country came into our airspace and within kui of our borders that would be a concern to be talking about i wouldn't say quite as another russia because i i do think china is very measured in its support for russia china is very pragmatic it realizes its rise to superpower status was based on access to the world capitalist market yeah and it won't do anything to endanger that because the political legitimacy of the ruling communist party in china depends on economic growth so it won't be doing anything to invite additional sanctions but um i do think um in a sense um new zealand um does worry that given the ambiguity of China in the, over what is a very straightforward violation of international law, and be, you know, after all, China, you would on the face of it should have come out against Russian aggression because China's always made place great store in state sovereignty and territorial integrity. Yeah, of course. Um, so I suppose we, I, I think there's considerable disappointment in New Zealand about China's ambiguity. Uh, on the Russian invasion. And I think that has led to, a, how should I put it, no longer giving China the benefit of the doubt. Not that, you know, we've been concerned about them for a long time in the Pacific, but I think that's hardening. But do you think, I mean, the sliding doors conversation now, because it's hypothetical, but if China had to come out with a strong condemnation of China and then this agreed arrangement between the Solomons and China had of been announced. Do you really think there would have been any different response from New Zealand and Australia? I, I think it, it could have been, yes, because we've chosen in the past to have a much more nuanced approach to China and, and saying that, you know, China was not Russia and, and, and China doesn't have the hostility to the Western world that Russia has consistently exhibited, in my view, since about 2012. Um, you know, Putin's been supporting national populists all around the world. And one of the great ironies was when he launched his invasion of full scale invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February, uh, was his claim that he was denazifying the country after he had yeah. backed neo Nazis in countries like Germany, for example, mm -hmm. AFD. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do think 
China, I think New Zealand is reassessing the situation. And um, I think there may be a sober realization that China cannot coexist in the way we previously thought it could with countries of different political systems. And yeah. um, it's puzzling because China's economy depends on markets dominated by countries of different political systems. So how far is China going to be forward leaning? I don't know. It's a, you know, it's a successful economy, unlike Russia's, which Russia's economy, even before the invasion of Ukraine, was about 11th in the world, smaller than Italy's. So it was always going to struggle to be to live up to its aspiration of being a great power. It is interesting to think if we were to take some kind of almost moral stance on, you know, the way a country operates in this in the style of politics they have and to align ourselves with like minded countries, what that would mean for our trade. And that kind of almost comes back to that original thought that I'm having about and 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 I'm and I'm th this is a naive statement and I get that, but if if we can choose to have a range with China, why can't the Solomon sort of thing? But look, just to just to wrap it up, I want to just go back to one part of this article and reread it out because this is the Prime Minister of the Solomon speaking when he said he made it clear to the, so the the Solomon Islands intends to continue its partnership with China, but added that New Zealand and Australia would be considered partner of choice when it comes to the uh, to the need to call for assistance in critical times. Um, much like I guess that relationship, if you've got leverage, as you've been saying, I mean, part of me kind of goes, well, if you're taking your business elsewhere, why would you call on us? But the flip side to that is if you do that, then you're basically giving a hundred percent of the relationship and support to China. So you don't want to do that again. So I think that's actually evidence of this leverage that you were talking about, because they're still saying, basically the Solomons are kind of almost playing, I play poker and there's this thing called big stack bully when you've got the most chips at the table. And then you can push people around. It's almost like China's going, I mean, sorry, Solomon's is going, look, New Zealand and Australia, we'll still use you when we need you, but we are going to keep talking to these big guys over there with all the money as well. And I think that just echoes, uh, that's an example of echoing what you're saying to do with the leverage. I think this is the Solomon's strategy. I think the reason that New Zealand has fallen almost into lockstep with Australia on the Solomon's is that both are sceptical that the Solomon's can play this sort of game effectively with a superpower. In other yeah. words, there's such a imbalance in power uh, that it may be all right playing, playing one liberal democracy off against another, but here the Solomon's government is trying to play off uh, a superpower, a rising superpower, against off against liberal democracies. It does, in the short term, have you know quite considerable attractions. For the Solomons, a very poor country which is seeking to maximise support for the, for itself, uh, which is an understandable, you know, desire. But um, I, I think, yeah, both New Zealand and Australia may be worried that um, that the Solomons is getting into something that could go over their heads, so to speak. Right. I don't know. You know, it may be, and I think the Solomons government is aware of that, and that's why they're aware of this somewhat. If almost a uh, patronizing view from the Solomon's point of view, um, that they won't be able to play this game. Uh, he's insisting they can, that they can actually have two security arrangements and it will not result in the Solomon's being compromised from what they still consider to be their natural partners, New Zealand and Australia. Amazing. As always, Professor Robert Patman, thank you for joining us today. Uh, great thank insights. You. And it's something I guess we'll keep an eye on over the forthcoming weeks, months, and who knows, even longer. Um, but uh, once again, on Big Hero News, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Pat. Cheers.